is the United Nations all talk and no action. The Security Council fails again in its attempts for a ceasefire in Syria and the bombing of Aleppo continues. So who's really calling the shots in this complex conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Russia has vetoed a UN resolution to end the bombing of Aleppo, and another Russian-sponsored resolution also failed. The UN is warning that if airstrikes continue on rebel-held areas, Syria's second-largest city will be destroyed by the end of the year. UN Chief Ban Ki-moon says that it's worse than a slaughterhouse. In a moment, we'll look at what options remain for Aleppo, but first, our Diplomatica editor James Bayes reports from New York on those UN votes. Two votes on two separate rival Security Council resolutions. One proposing a grounding of all military aircraft flying over Aleppo, vetoed by Russia. The second watered-down version proposed by Russia, which only got four votes in favour. A day of high drama in the Security Council, but also what must be seen as a day of shame that will do absolutely nothing to help the people of Aleppo. Today we're participating in one of the strangest spectacles in the history of the Security Council, voting on two draft resolutions of the Council knowing that neither will be adopted. But many others blame that spectacle on the Russian ploy of introducing a second resolution at the last minute and vetoing the first resolution that would otherwise have passed. Normally, I begin my statements in this council with the words, thank you, Mr. President. I cannot do that today. Because today, we have seen the fifth veto in five years on Syria from you, Mr. President. A veto that has once again stopped this council from creating the unity needed to give the people of Syria any hope for respite from their suffering. The U.S. representative was also scathing about the role of Russia. Today was time for the Council to act, to learn the lessons of the recent past. We failed to do that because one of us, perversely the President of the United Nations Security Council, is intent on allowing the killing to continue and indeed participating in carrying it out. It is grotesque. There are few diplomatic options left. The International Syria Support Group, all the key international and regional players, got nowhere. Then there were efforts by the US and Russia. They're now not talking to each other. And the last ditch option was trying to get the Security Council to take a lead. They've now hit a roadblock. There is one final initiative led by Security Council member New Zealand. Its ambassador, Gerard van Bohemen, already has his own draft text and he's consulting with other countries about one more attempt to get agreement around the Security Council table. James Bayes, Al Jazeera, at the United Nations. Well, millions of Syrians have fled their homes during the five years of fighting and there's been a large exodus from Aleppo. But the UN says there could still be two million people trapped in the city, many afraid that their homes will be taken by the regime if they leave. More than 400 civilians, around one-third of them children, have been killed in the last two weeks alone. Hospitals have been continuously bombarded in Aleppo. There are now only five which remain operational in the besieged part of the city. Well, we'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first I want to speak to uh, Dr. Uh, Megedic Terzian, uh, who is the president of Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières. Welcome to Inside Story. So what are you hearing about uh, conditions inside Aleppo right now? Conditions are catastrophic according to the 35 doctors remaining uh, in the town. Uh, they are telling uh, simply bombs are raining uh, continuously uh, on Aleppo since weeks and weeks. Uh, wounded patients everywhere. Uh, eight hospitals only uh, are capable to continue to function with big difficulties. 
that is quite a concern, isn't it? The, the fact that the, John Kerry has said the, the, the bombing of, of civilians in, in Aleppo could amount to war crimes and, and that medical facilities uh, appear to be being deliberately targeted. Yes, since the beginning of this conflict, uh, hospitals and uh, med the medical mission in general is systematically attacked and honestly no one cares. So five years after uh, Aleppo, unfortunately, it's not an exception. Uh, the problem, the major problem are the 250,000 population that they are besieged in Aleppo uh, and they are under bombs uh, since several weeks now. It's the same situation in other besieged zones like rural Damascus, uh, in homes as well. So the situation uh, is, uh, is very bad as well in these besieged areas, knowing that there is 18 besieged zones in Syria, majority of them under the opposition uh, control. Uh, of course, uh, water supplies have been directly targeted. There's, there's a, a limited availability of, of fresh water. Food supplies are dwindling. 400 people have died in the, in the last couple of weeks alone. This is a situation that's only going to get worse, isn't it? Yes, unfortunately, people are very pessimistic. Uh, they have difficulties to find water. They have difficulties to receive electricity. Uh, if this situation will continue, clearly in the hospitals in the coming weeks, the situation will be uh, catastrophic because they need water to control the hygiene of the hospital. They need electricity to continue to work in proper way. And if there is no basic conditions, it will be very difficult for this population stuck in Aleppo town to reach the medical facilities. And, and what, what would your message be to the politicians at, at, at the United Nations who, who, who failed so abysmally at the weekend once again to pass a resolution to stop the violence in Unfortunately, Aleppo? Uh, all the resolutions failed again uh, in this uh, conflict. We are not politicians. Uh, we are trying simply to report what our colleagues are reporting from Aleppo, uh, hoping that a miracle will happen and uh, the politicians finally will find a solution. Dr. Terzian, many thanks indeed. Thank you. All right, so let's bring in our guests for today's program. Joining us from Moscow, Sergei Markov, director of the Institute for Political Studies and public spokesman for President Putin. From Washington, we're joined by Hillary Mann Leverett, a former White House national security official. And from Abu Dhabi, we're joined by Monza Akbik, spokesman of Tomorrow Movement. That's a Syrian opposition group. Welcome to you all. Sergei Markov, we'll start with you. We heard um, right at the beginning of the program uh, the U.S. and uh, British ambassadors criticizing uh, Russia's uh, veto at uh, the U.N. Security Council. Has Russia abused its veto privilege here? Of course, that's no chance uh, without destroying of United Nations. Uh, but uh, now we see a little bit irrational policy of Washington and London. So we can believe in uh, that they can try even to uh, crash United Nations, one of the major uh, in institutes of for international community. I think uh, uh, the main uh, problem in Aleppo and Syria is the United States, in fact, became the ally of Al-Qaeda named Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, they tried to separate pro-American uh, 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 rebels in Syria from uh, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra as they cannot do it during the year. Probably there are no uh, possibility to make the division between Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra and uh, pro-American uh, pro uh, Syrian uh, rebels. And uh, I want to ask uh, American officials, uh, including American soldiers, do you agree that uh, some uh, crazy Washington politicians making your allies of Al-Qaeda, those Al-Qaeda which attacked Americans and killed thousands of America in New York uh, on uh, September 11? Hillary Mann, and, uh, all right, uh, all right, let, let's, that, okay. uh, all right let, let's, let's bring in the, Hillary Mann Leverett then in, in Washington. Uh, what, what do you make of, of what you just heard then? I mean, Russia calls its aerial activities over Aleppo anti-terrorist strikes, uh, and, and Russia's foreign minister says he can't see that the U.S. is seriously fighting militants from, from the group that was formerly known as, as al-Nusra and is suspicious of, of Washington's mm -hmm. calls for Russia and the Syrian Air Force to cease their bombing runs on Aleppo. 
You know, the, the Russian position is an interesting one, and it has gained traction. It has gained power and dominance, as we see clearly on the military battle battlefield in Syria, but also politically, because it points, I think, objectively to an incoherence here in Washington that even supporters of the Obama administration, among Democrats especially, see a real incoherence in this determination, this rhetorical determination to fight terrorism, but then to try to pick out who's a good terrorist and who's a bad terrorist. It's something that is, is really, uh, I think, riddling the, the presidential uh, campaign here and putting people that otherwise would normally be di diametrically opposed on political issues, be they foreign policy or domestic, um, on, on one side, which points to an incoherence in the, uh, the current administration's policy on Syria. Let's bring in Monza Akbik then in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Russia's foreign ministry said that, that the other resolution, that the one that, um, uh, the one that it, it vetoed, uh, the Franco-Spanish one, distorts the real situation in Syria and that an aerial ban would only provide cover to, quote, terrorists. What do you make of that? Well, definitely, this is not a war on terror. You know, when you are bombing indiscriminately uh, a city, uh, the eastern part of Aleppo, where there is about 300,000 people living, most of them women and children, you're bombing hospitals, you're bombing marketplaces, and killing all these children and, uh, and saying that I, I am fighting terrorism. This is ridiculous. This is not a fight on terrorism. This is fight on the people. This is a war against the people that uh, Bashar al-Assad started uh, five years ago because the people wanted freedom and democracy, and he's co still continuing with this war. In East Aleppo, there are only 300, uh, the number of the fighters from al-Nusra Front, which is classified in United Nations resolutions as terrorist group, and there are 9,000 other fighters, rebels, who are not classified as terrorists. So because we have 300 people, we are wiping out the whole city uh, and we are destro destroying the whole city because of 300 fighters. This is not, this is not logical. In Daraya, for example, uh, west of Damascus, there was no, no one single fighter from al-Nusra and the city was sieged by the regime for about uh, three and a half years and the people were starved until they got out completely out of the city. So this okay. war is very clear. Uh, it's a war on the people, and it's a war okay. to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. And al-Nusra is being used as uh, just uh, excuse, you, and it's uh, used just to continue you, with this okay. rejection of the ceasefire uh, attempts that was uh, tried by France and Sp uh, Spain. You quoted some figures there. Uh, Stefan de Mistura, the, the UN Special Envoy to Syria, told the Security Council that it was the presence of 1,000 or so uh, al-Nusra fighters that was being, <clears throat> excuse me, being used as a pretext for the bombing of, uh, of 275,000 people. Uh, Sergei Malkov, uh, Russia is helping to wage war against the people, is it? Of course, it's pure propaganda. It's difficult, frankly speaking, it's pity to hear that our colleagues and opponents don't want to discuss real issues. And real issue, first of all, separation of clear terrorists such as Al-Qaeda, Jafkat, and Nusra from uh, pro-American uh, 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 rebels. And uh, why you don't divide them? Uh, uh, my uh, colleague didn't uh, want to answer those questions, we, but we, now we have clear answer because, in fact, no difference between them because this is uh, so-called uh, uh, moderate uh, jihadist and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. In fact, one army, and they fighting as one army. And second issue that we should discuss: it's the Mistura plan. It's I think it's a very good plan. It uh, can help to save. Uh, a tragical humanitarian situation in Aleppo. Let's uh, allow to those fighters to leave right. Aleppo and to go to Adlib under the control of the United Nations without any no bombing okay. from the uh, uh, Syrian government. So, so okay. um, Russia, as I said a few moments ago, Russia calls its aerial activities over Aleppo anti-terrorist strikes. Just who is it that Russia is targeting in, in Aleppo then? And, and how come so many innocent civilians, children, uh, are, are being killed and injured by, by Russian strikes? 
uh, you know, uh, I think the number of children which have been killed by uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, United States led, led coalition much more, much more than from uh, uh, Russian strike. It's you know, it's cruel war. Sometimes uh, civilians can will uh, can uh, also uh, can be killed. But uh, main problem is not Russian activity which support more or less civilized uh, 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 ophthalmologists. Uh, Bashar Assad. The problem is that those who want to overthrow uh, Bashar Assad, uh, they are mostly uh, jihadists and uh, terrorists. You know, those who want freedom and democracy, they usually, yes, you, they usually don't take Kalashnikov and go uh, to fight uh, in okay. Aleppo and in other cities. You're usually sitting uh, in Facebook, uh, in uh, Paris or London or in uh, Doha. The okay. problem is, I can repeat, separate Al-Qaeda. And please, United States, don't be a lie of Al-Qaeda. Okay. And we hope that honest uh, United States officers now clearly will send signal to own government. All we right. all don't want to be a uh, lie of Al-Qaeda. Uh, Hillary Mann, Leverett, what, what do you make of, of that? Why, why has U.S. policy on Syria been such a failure? It was a strategic mistake to begin with. We knew that invading Iraq was a disaster. Invading Iraq not only led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, but it essentially, in a way, strategically gave influence over Iraq to Iran. The military intervention in Libya, similarly, uh, was a disaster strategically. It gave over to Libya to, to chaos and led to this enormous refugee problem or contributed to it significantly. Similarly, our invasion of Afghanistan back in 2001 was a strategic disaster. So the, the decision here very quickly, very uh, uh, just really off the cuff to call for the overthrow of, 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 the, Sir of the Syrian government was something that was reckless to begin with. And I think increasingly people in Washington understand that. They understand that there is not a military victory to be had that the United States could claim, which is why the United States keeps coming back to the diplomatic process with Russia. As much as people really hate it here in Washington, they find it embarrassing, they find it a perception of weakness of the Obama administration, they find it distasteful. But there is no other way out of what otherwise will be an enormous strategic embarrassment for the United States. There will continue to be, I think, uh, these kind of negotiations. And it's important, I think, for all the actors involved to spare the lives of thousands of more Syrians to get serious about a negotiated settlement and not to be focused on whether you know a fighter is moderate or not. It's really an oxymoron to call a fighter moderate or terrorist extreme. They're a fighter. Fighters fight because they're good at killing, not because they're good at democracy. Okay. All right. M Monsa Akbik, um, what happens next, do you think? Um, in the run-up to, to Saturday's vote, Germany's foreign minister said that the mounting tension between the U.S. And, and Russia had created a situation that was more dangerous than the Cold War. F France's uh, uh, ambassador, or was it the, the foreign minister, actually, Jean-Marc Ayrault, said uh, that the vote was a moment of truth for the Security Council. Is there any hope now, do you think, of finding a, a, a diplomatic solution to Syria's war brokered by the U.N.? Well, I have seen the uh, Security Council session yesterday uh, and the sessions before that. It's obvious that uh, there is a confrontation, diplomatic, uh, serious diplomatic confrontation between the West and Russia nowadays. Uh, there is a very strong uh, statements from both sides against each other. Now, uh, the Western group is uh, calling uh, Russia or accusing Russia that uh, uh, doing uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes in Syria by killing all these civilians with the with the bombing and nobody really uh, is buying that they are destroying all these cities and killing all these people just because they want to kill a few hundreds of uh, terrorists now uh, what what next for us Syrians I would say that uh, of course it was much better if the resolution for uh, to stop the bombing and cessation of hostilities of in Aleppo and allowing humanitarian aid to enter Aleppo, if that was adopted, should have been much better. But uh, unfortunately, it was not. So this means that Aleppo will still be sieged, that the people will still uh, cannot uh, have uh, food and medicine, 
and many places also they cannot have water. And this means that the bombing will continue and the war will continue and there will be more bloodshed, more suffering of the people. This, uh, that's why, of course, uh, we, are, we, are, we are not seeing any light at the end of the tunnel on a short term uh, now. And, of course, we cannot see that, okay. uh, uh, foreseen that, uh, that there will be a world war because of Aleppo. So what we are hoping for now, at least that, uh, that the rebels should have something to defend themselves in the time being until right. such a ceasefire agreement could be reached between the superpowers. Sergey, with, with relations having deteriorated as they have between Russia and the U.S., can you see them ever uh, uh, coming together to work to bring peace to, to Syria? W will they ever see eye to eye on, on Syria again? Uh, of course, we very uh, want uh, to have a compromise uh, on uh, in Syria and uh, peaceful uh, moving uh, uh, there. But uh, main what should be done: uh, United States should stop support Al Qaeda. Now it's very, very much clear, and civilians in Aleppo use as uh, hostages uh, by uh, such a military coalition of uh, Al Qaeda. It means Jabhat al Nusra and pro. American uh, rebels and fighters. And we very much uh, ask uh, our uh, American partner uh, to be more rational and to be more clear and also to have the policy which is uh, supported by American people. We know very well that American people want United States to be a Russian ally in fighting against Al Qaeda in the Syria and in other areas to fight against international terrorism. And we very much dissatisfied by the fact that Washington, in the strong contradiction with the political will of the American people, now prepared to be a military ally of Al Qaeda against uh, uh, Russia in okay. Syria. It could be very dangerous development, but we very hope that yeah. rationality and democracy will win in Washington. Okay, uh, Hillary, I just want to ask you about what, what Sergei was saying there. How do the so-called uh, moderate uh, opposition groups in, in, in Aleppo separate themselves from uh, the group formerly known as, as, as Al Nusra. That, that's one point I want you to take on, on there that, that, that Sergei was talking about. And also about the danger we were talking about here and this escalation. Uh, and, and um, you know, Frank, Frank Walter Steinmeier's comments that, that this is a situation that, that's rapidly becoming more dangerous than the Cold War. Absolutely. You know, the, the issue of moderate uh, fighters versus terrorist fighters or extreme fighters is, is really farcical in a way. As, as I said, there really is not a lot of difference. And I don't say that to say that the Russian position is correct. I say that as a statement of fact. It's very it's almost impossible to distinguish between these fighters. And that's why you see the incoherence in U.S. policy on this point. I don't think the United States is intentionally trying to uh, to stop a ceasefire or to stop the bloodshed in Syria. It's just an enormous policy problem of Washington's own making, but it's still an enormous policy problem here that I think will only be resolved, in a sense, by the next president. And you could not have a more stark choice before the American people between a President Clinton and a President Trump. They are diametrically opposed in terms of how to work with Russia. And I think the, the, the German foreign minister has put his finger on a critically important issue for the world, which in part will be decided by the presidential race here, which is the future of U.S.-Russian relations. They have never been this bad, including during the Cold War. During the Cold War, the United States recognized Russian interests in Syria and, of course, in, in, the, in the former Soviet space. Today, the United States does not. And whether Russia is uh, willing and capable of confronting the United States on this issue could really be uh, one of the most momentous uh, issues facing the world today. And in part, it will be decided by what the next president of the United States decides to do vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis Russia. And that, I'm afraid, and is where we Syria. must end our discussion. Many thanks indeed uh, to you all. Sergei Markov uh, in Moscow, Hillary Mandel-Everett in Washington and in Abu Dhabi, Monza Akbik. And thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again at any time by going to aljazeera.com. For further discussion on this issue, join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash 
AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.